Hello viewers, welcome to Political Currents, the show that brings you comprehensive coverage of our nation's political landscape. I'm your host, Rashid Onyagi. In this program, we dive deep into the heart of Nigeria's politics, bringing you the latest updates, insightful analyses, in-depth discussions on the issues that matter to you. In each edition, we will be joined by political leaders, policy experts, and voices of everyday Nigerians as we explore the currents that shape our political discourse. We'll tackle the tough questions, challenge the status quo, and strive to understand the complexities of our diverse and dynamic political environment. So sit back and relax. Let's navigate the currents of Nigeria's politics together. Uh, and this week, we will be looking at the issue of the strike. Of course, it's all over the airwaves, and uh, this is just a contribution to the entire discourse, but uh, from a different perspective this time. And uh, I will be talking to some, somebody who is kind of, uh, well, not strictly in the political mainstream, but uh, a man who has what it takes to dissect the motivations behind the um, actions of all the parties involved uh, in this current uh, dispute. Uh, the uh, strikes are not new in Nigeria. We have a whole history of strikes to talk about. On May 31st, uh, the NLC, along with the other labor unions, um, made good on their threat to shut the country down, literally, uh, over the dispute it has been having with government over the national minimum wage. Uh, of course, you can always expect that labor will have their own template, uh, because now we are, we are talking about templates, but that comes later. Uh, labor were asking for the government to review the national minimum wage. Uh, and a host of other demands, uh, which came on the heels of what appears to be a declining economic condition in Nigeria. Um, Nigeria is running, a, well, it's not what I would call a hyperinflation. It's still manageable, but inflation is inflation. And it is characterized by um, not just rising prices, but um, uh, we have a substantial percentage of unemployment uh, in the country and uh, the Naira has lost 60% of its value within the last one year alone. Um, so uh, things were really getting to a point where the common man, as they would say, was beginning to feel a little bit overburdened and uh, labor usually do ride on the uh, back of those kind of uh, public uh, discontent. Uh, but uh, this was different because uh, they went on strike for just one day and we all felt it. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, we can talk about the removal of subsidy, which was one of uh, Tinobu's, um, uh, President Tinobu's uh, promise when he was campaigning and he did remove the subsidy. Uh, and a, ho a host of other policies that were tailored uh, ostensibly to give the economy the jolt that it, it requires to continue to grow. But all these uh, stories, uh, we are here to actually look at the underpinnings of uh, labor's motivations in doing what they have done and uh, basically look forward to see how labor can reposition itself, how the government itself can respond better to uh, labor's demands because uh, people will always make demands of government but the impact is not only felt in government the private sector too is one of the in fact the private sector being the engine of the nigeria's economic growth uh, really has to come in uh, into the into the picture uh, either too there's always been this whole idea that the talks between labor and government is strictly has to do with the salaries of civil servants and whatnot. But that is also part of it, but not uh, the whole of it. But 
Uh, let me not preempt matters. I have with me here this evening a very, very uh, important personality who's going to discuss this subject with me. And uh, uh, let me introduce you to Malam Danger Abdullahi. I was pronouncing the name as Danger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but his name is the Malam Danger Abdullahi. He's the former director of the National Council for Arts and Culture. Uh, he's also the former president of the Association of Nigerian Authors. He's a poet, he's a playwright and cultural administrator. But most importantly, he's also a politician. <laughs> <laughs> you can't operate within the political economy and not be a politician. And he has a very, very solid academic background, uh, which has seen a lot of uh, important uh, books being written. I have one in front of me here, uh, extremely fat book written uh, about him uh, is uh, of foot soldiers and hybrid visions. It's a first trip in honor of uh, Denja Yahya Abdullahi. Uh, this is, I'm going to take time to read this, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure by the time I finish it, uh, I think I can predict what. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me on this and, program. Uh, it's really an honor to have you here. Thank you so uh, much. So um, you have been witness to this. Um, yeah. Um, strike. Mm. Um, let's first start with how you see it, um, mm. what you think about it. When I saw the labor's um, activation of their strike mechanism, as uh, well expected, because the uh, labor as a body is supposed to look after the problems of the workers. They are supposed to fight for the interests of workers. They are supposed to be eternally on their watch against anything that will affect what workers will get in the polity. So their response was uh, predictable, very predictable, because uh, the way they were negotiating with government and government was not like forthcoming the way they wanted. So labor had to resort to a strike. I, the strike, I, could, I would say, was needless. In effect, it was not supposed to be in the first place because in Nigeria, when two sides are negotiating, they all know where they should compromise. If government is talking to labor, there's a committee that was formed with all form fair. A lot of money was budgeted for that committee, a billionaire. And at a point, it, it was, it was an opera that I could, a mere committee, be demanding for that kind of money and the government cut it down to half of it and we believed the belief was that this committee should work well they should say they should tell themselves the truth the, the, the parties the tripartite parties in that committee should work well we shouldn't hear of it we shouldn't have gone, gone through that issue of strike if everybody if all the groups in that body were sincere because labor was there to protect labor government also has a view, government is also there to, to think for everybody. Government has a kind of uh, commitment or a kind of um, uh, uh, ideology, let me put it like that. They, 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 they have to think beyond labor, yeah. beyond those who are just working for government. Now, the private sector is also a very critical factor because a lot of people too are working under that sector and they were all living in the same economy. So I feel if they have spoken to themselves sincerely, because everybody has to be realistic. If the three tripartite group in that uh, talk were very realistic with themselves, we don't need to have. We don't. Labor, the, 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 there will be no. There will, there will be no reason for labor to go on strike. We don't know what happened behind the closed doors, or uh, what yeah. negotiation led to the. Obviously, you have yes. to conclude that there was a breakdown. Yes. In those One can predict what will have led to that labor strike. Depression. But it also seems to me that labor really wanted to go on strike yes um, and um, regardless of what uh, uh what decision was uh, what uh, what agreement what positions what common ground uh they were able to arrive at with the government it yeah. seems they are <laughs> hell-bent on going on strike. yeah it will appear like that because they had seen that if they didn't go that way government would not do what they wanted or what they want and that was how that was why they went on strike 
I had really labor in some uh, uh, academic labor when I was in the, mm, when yes. I was lecturing. I was in academic uh, as staff as as <laughs> yeah. And I know that what the what most what what segment <laughs> of the labor force. Yes. What <laughs> what already happened is this: when you are that sex, sect up, yeah. you always think of those who you are fighting for, and you know what they want, and you don't want to be seen as not adequate to protect their interests. So you go out of your way to do whatever to get your members satisfied. That was just what Labour did. And uh, of course, the ideology behind the unions is just this adversarial ideology that look, when you are negotiating with those who control capital, hmm? yes, those who are the establishment, mm. the feeling in your heart is that they will never give you what is adequate or what you need, you have to fight for it. And because of that perception, the labor, labor, the labor union are always very radical. So are you basically suggesting that mm. labor was grandstanding? Uh, yeah. There may have been an agreement before they went on strike, yes. yet they yes. still went on strike. Yes. You would know the details of what they agreed in their closed door, but uh, an element of grandstanding is always part of labor activity. Yeah, but government made an offer. Yes. Not not really a farm offer, but I think uh, they they were going for sixty thousand. You know, and you that was that was pretty much public knowledge. If you look at it from the from the outside, from yes. the, from those of us on the streets that were yes. not party to what they were talking, yes, and from the angle of the public servant, mm. the offer of government was ridiculous. Hmm? I'm awesome. talking. Of, I'm talking of people from from the public perspective from the perception of workers that have a, if we're talking of a minimum wage increase, because of the way everything has been, inflation has buffeted and buried a lot of people in the country, people were expecting that, look, we should get something uh, tangible as a minimum wage. Of course, the labor's demand for 490 was ridiculous, was ridiculous. That amount labor was demanding for uh, 600,000, oh, that's a ridiculous amount. We all know it's ridiculous including those who are asking for it, including the labor, labor themselves. The coming down to 485,000 was also ridiculous. <laughs> so Yes, they, they know it was ridiculous, but they were aiming that high, knowing that if they aim that high, by the time they battle, they will come to a significant a, a number that will, that will still have the cost. Well, that's, it, that's the essence of uh, bargaining. Exactly. So we all knew, we all knew then that, or we still know that 400,000, 600,000 cannot be a minimum wage in Nigeria, no matter what we are talking about. Is it payable? We know it's not payable. Government cannot pay it. Even for those of us who are not in government, it, a point in time in Nigeria here, during the regime, the government was borrowing money to pay salaries. Yeah. Uh, government that was borrowing money, printing money. Okay, we, to, we, to, we, we will come to that. Yes. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> now, if you say 495,000, which is what the... Yes the labor unions are asking for yes. mm. uh, is unreasonable yes. um, uh, and the offer of government of 60,000 is also ridiculous yes. <laughs> yes. so now we are met with uh, a ridiculous offer to a, a reasonable, a, offer. To a reasonable <laughs> or, projection, or reasonable projection. Yes, yes. now in your opinion yes. what would be even if we have to draw a fine line between that two mm. points uh, we still arrive at something in the range of uh, uh, 150, 200. Yes. You know, even do you think that's even reasonable? Even the 200. Because what people don't know when you increase the minimum wage. Yes. Those, even, those who enjoy that wage, it's not even those people labor, labor are fighting for. Those who enjoy it are the top executives in government, very senior officers. By the time you increase the minimum wage to around 100,000, or 400,000, and you now do the consequential adjustment across the cadres. Yes. A power secretary will be collecting like 5 million naira. A director with the government will be collecting, a director on level 17 will be collecting like 3 million. So the, the, way, the, the people at the lower end that labor always fight for, they don't end up benefiting from those, uh, the way the labor thinks from that increasing wage. Those who enjoy it are the people at the top. Now, from that projection made and the offer government made, the middle point that most of us looking from the outside knows that they will, two of them, if they are sincere with themselves, all the people in that, in that team, they will be arriving at about 100,000. 
and the hundred thousand too will not be very easy for the government to pay. I know that because well, uh, yeah. in this case we are talking about uh, f the federal government, yeah, federal uh, government. which uh, which has always been the focus of labor. Yes, and then labor will now start to uh, attack the issue of implementation of minimum wage on a state by state basis, which is still also subject to negotiation. Now, if the minimum wage, mm. which is a legislated minimum yes. for any Nigerian to be paid mm. if he's being employed in any place, mm. if the legislated minimum wage is, let's say, 150,000, yes. uh, should any party, either an employer, an employee, yes. offer anything less than that in nigeria the realistic approach to that issue in nigeria the realistic appraiser the minimum wage is being implemented in clear breach of, the, of that law the only organ of government or the only sector of government where that wage is implemented religiously in adherence to the minimum wage law yes is the federal government, the federal government. beyond the federal government let us not deceive ourselves even private sector the private sector don't pay those minimum wages even within, just, even within government itself i can tell you because i work with government even within government itself some of the people that government are sourced from the payroll you know, some private sector operators they still work with government their services have been outsourced if you check they are not paying government is not paying that minimum wage to those outsourced people that work for government let me just break it down now for example government pays security security cleaning all these services yes. have been outsourced and i can tell you for my experience with the government where this set of people have been paid from government posts they are not even at uh, this current existing minimum wage some of them are paid 12,000 12, per, per, per month so now you... so government <coughs> government even breach that same yes that same law they promulgated so if we now say government should pay even we that some people in the private sector now for example the meaning of that minimum wage law is that you even if you employ security man in your house you must pay him you pay minimum him. yes but does, does that happen we know all what we pay our people attached to us personally in the house we don't pay we cannot we can because even what we earn cannot does not give us that power to pay that kind of wages so if if, we, if that is the case uh federal government staff we, we by uh, entirely they are no more than maybe one point so two million or whatever mm -hmm. out of the entire 230 million Nigerians. they are those people who, who enjoy those, that minimum wage to the letter state government forget about it local government i don't know if they pay the such wages at local government so if if labor is advocating when they are making this advocacy for wages they should think in a broad way broad uh, broad manner but by looking at the everybody in the society that is working how does that affect everybody down the line and up the line and we even talk of for example those who have worked for government and have retired you don't enjoy this money we were talking about if you remember very recently the dg of the pension commission pension commission in nigeria had to write the government that the government is violating the constitution of nigeria by what it is paying people who are who have retired from government the pension they pay is yeah it's, it's public it's public knowledge now if you pension people that have worked serve the government for years that are retired what are they getting what they are getting cannot sustain them to live a life in this country and do you have a whole lot of people in that category who are suffering silently labor is not thinking of those people when they go goes to negotiate for some of the things they talk about those people are not in their purview at all now so it's like labor chooses the fight to fight in order for to, to gain some public uh, image within the within the radical setup they you, 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 you we have to think of so many parts of the society so many people that are working those who have worked are no longer working who are still dependent on government what are they getting from this government so what do you think the government should have done to make things better before the strike actually uh became the only option that labor has well, the government has rolled out a lot of uh, programs, very fantastic uh, measures to cushion the effect of 
the removal of the subsidy, and the CNG bonus, the, the student loan, credit credit facilities that was also launched that you could access a lot of things through credit. Yes, which consumer is credit. credit. Yes, okay. consumer credit, and so many of them that I read about when I look at uh, the NOAA bulletin, well explained from government perspective. Those things are wonderful, fantastic, and more of such policies, projects, schemes should be brought on board to, by government to immediately address the areas in which people are facing a lot of problems. The one that is even very worrying is the food inflation. If those of us who go to the market, who sends our wife to the market, honestly, in every house, forget the class in Nigeria today, <laughs> every house is very managing to survive, to, to eat. Yes, in, including the house that I am from. I know what I eat in my house a year ago, six months ago, and what I eat now. Now, if it's like that for our class, then what do we talk of the poorer people? Now, so everybody across the cross board, including the rich. Now, why is food still expensive in this country? Why? Government should look into that area. I know government has done a lot of agricultural scheme. Anchor Borua, so many other things in the past that have worked. Now, government will immediately address this matter. How food can come cheaply onto people's table. Because if that is not addressed, that will lead to a whole lot of problems that government will not be able to control. Even labor itself will not be able to control it. Because if we look at history, what sets people ablaze is when food is no longer coming. <laughs> eh? The French Revolution was over bread. Exactly, bread. <laughs> so, so, and all, somebody says jokingly somewhere, all the theories of Marx, all those political theories, it's all about what comes to somebody's stomach, what you eat, what we, what you eat, we work because we want to eat. All the work we do, including those people in the army, the people in labor, is so that you will feed yourself and your family. When that is no longer something that you can take for granted, we have a very serious problem on our hands. And if government is not looking at that level and try to roll out so many schemes to make food cheap. In Lagos, I know there was this uh, market, a co-market, mm -hmm. where people buy food cheaply. Yes, yes. Things like that has to be replicated. People must eat. Because if people cannot find food, there's nothing you can tell them again. Okay, talking yes. about uh, ideology, we'll yeah. come back to that after mm. uh, we go on a short break because it's important for us to understand yes. uh, the underpinnings of labor's motivations mm. and their actions and their activism. Why are they doing the things they do? And government too, which does not even appear to have an ideological position with mm. regards to economy or anything yeah. else. Um, well, we'll, <laughs> you will tell us that <laughs> yes. when we return from yes. this break. Don't right, go anywhere. Okay. We'll be right back. Uh, welcome back. Mm. Uh, you're still watching uh, Political Currents coming to you from Rapid TV uh, on channel 176 Star Times and on the free to air night concert. Um, I've been talking to my guest. Malam uh, Denja Abdullahi, who is the former director of the National Council for Arts and Culture and also the president of uh, Association of Nigerian Authors, uh, uh, is a poet, is a playwright, is a cultural administrator, but most of all, is also lives within the nexus of, uh, of uh, people's aspirations. Uh, as a writer, as a playwright, you have to be, you have to be well connected yeah. to people's um, um, emotions and aspirations to mm. be able to uh, understand them and push it out to the public. I've read some of your works. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think it was something about uh, Borno State. Yes, uh, Bauchi. Bauchi, okay, it was yeah. Bauchi State. Yes. Very, very nice, interesting uh, series of short stories. Mm. But today we are talking about the labor strike and how it is impacting Nigerians and how we Thing because we are also in the media, we are the agenda setters, uh, advise government on what to do to ensure that um, these kind of things don't occur again. If you have to release some of the events that happened in that 24 hours in which mm -hmm. the labor went on strike, uh, even I have uh, seen many strikes in Nigeria and this one was bad. <laughs> it was like curfew. You know, um, people were 
generally not prepared for it because exactly. we were all expecting that well since by monday they will have negotiated Results, and yeah. there will be no strike mm -hmm. and then monday morning uh the whole country went on that total blackout uh i won't discuss the implications of that or even why labor saw it fit to go that far to press home their demands mm -hmm. you know uh, of course uh, that's a story for another day whether they have not actually crossed the line between activism and illegality mm. of actually uh, sabotaging the entire power infrastructure of the country by simply turning off the light a lot of things depend on this even the running of the economy depends on power as little as of it as we have uh if we don't if you have to take everything else uh that's that's and we were looking at the possibility of a prolonged strike yes uh, and i believe if that strike has prolonged for more than 24 hours mm -hmm. uh we we'll probably have a, a an emergency situation on our hand mm -hmm. that might push the government to also cross some lines exactly um but ideologically speaking do you think the lab labor has lost its way well labor will always what will work for labor is to remain with the ideology they've always been associated with yes in the sense that labor is uh, pro people labor is supposed to be radical labor is supposed to be even marxian in outlook labor is supposed to be a progressive to have a progressive apollo, uh, uh, ideology because you look at them they represent the lowest of the low mm. forget our people that work with government that are permanent secretary mm. that are government the labor is not working for those class of people though they are also workers the labor is represented, represented the voiceless of the society the workers the poor workers those who are who can be cheated by those who own capital or those who own how, so, how many labor, of the, how many of those do we still have no, left labor, in nigeria no, labor <laughs> labor, is, labor is beyond just the people who work for federal government okay but it's like in the in the way they operate now they've forgotten that they have the masses of nigeria as they are as their constituency they have forgotten that but if you check the labels of some years back when they talk they talk of the whole under colonial but labor. how do you see labor's connection mm. to partisan politics through the nexus of the labor party, labor party and the fact that uh principal actors within both spaces tend to generally Me, i see that uh, that labor party has just a, a a framework that has no connection deeply to the labor, to the labor movement itself because if that labor party <laughs> is deeply connected to labor how can, uh, how no, can let, they not be connected no, let me, let me they say share something. the same logo the, roughly no, the same what logo. i'm trying to say is this they are <laughs> only sharing that uh, is, 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 is the but you can trace the, no, the, the origin of the labor party no, to the labor, I, I'm to to the point. labor union itself the connection is not deep and that also tells on what labor represents yes because me looking from the outside i expect the labor party to be the party that every worker in nigeria will belong to to be the party that the man selling the roasted yam on the street there should be part of why is that not like that why is it not like that it's not like that because that party is not representing the labor it's not representing what we call labor that party is just some uh, it's just a party that some people formed to advance some of their, some of their selfish but interests. there's a general perception that, that is there's where a I connection between labor party and the labor unions I, i'm know, not saying there's no uh, connection but i'm saying that connection is tenuous so you that, don't, that connection so, does not so, so you don't think that uh, uh the labor party is a is a plank is a bridge in which labor can transform itself into a political force it will be, it will, it will be very difficult for them to transform into a political force in the sense that labor itself a partisan political force part, I mean. it, will, it will be very difficult because before you transform a party into a political force you have to carry the mass of the people along yes. the labor today that we have i'm sorry to say is not carrying the mass of nigerians along that is labor i'm not the talking party about the, or the union the labor itself okay because if, if, if that is not happening because before a labor a labor union becomes a force that will carry everybody along 
you must be seen to have fought for everybody. But if, you, if the labor is fighting for only a segment of the population of Nigeria, those who collect money from but government, the people no, don't see that. Way. Uh, that's what I'm looking at. It. If yes. the labor is only fighting for a segment of those who earn salary from government, then how, how many are, are those people? But by advocating that the labor should actually fight for the people, you're asking them to enter the political space, which I think they already did with the labor party. Uh, where, where is the party going? The party is not making the headway to make because of that uh, disconnect between labor as a union and the re and the masses of Nigerians. In the country the way that has worked, for example, in is, you know, is Yugoslavia or well, one country, two or three countries where yeah. labor leaders emerge the president of those nations, Poland. Poland. Yes. You could see there's an organic connection between that party and the masses of those of, the, of that country. Yeah. And they produce leadership. Now and you can only achieve that if people see you in that spectrum of labor as a fighter for their rights. And they will not hope that, okay, let us put these uh, people in good government. So but in Nigeria, people have already seen labor as, labor has become an aristoc aristocracy. So let you believe that, that even within the restricted space of activism that they are now, they mm. should engage more in the political space on behalf of the generality of the masses. That is what they should do. So that if they have that following and the masses that are following are seeing what labor is doing is actually working. People will listen to them. Let me let me let, let us go back to the period of that Oshomole. Yes. When Oshomole was the president of the Nigerian Labor Congress, we know how labor was higher up there to command yes, yes, followership yes. from the masses of Nigeria. Yes. Why did you think that was happening? He then? even leveraged on that exactly. on that popularity to become, to become governor. a governor. Yes. It was like that because when Oshomole speaks spoke when he speaks then, people know this man is out to 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 to, to, to to, to, to but Oshomale's uh, eh? success yes. in that respect yes. comes from a deep understanding of the uh, political uh, positioning of the government vis-a-vis exactly. -vis his the labor's ideological, yes. you know, uh, 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 positions. Let, so let, and he, he knew how to counter let, them. Let properly. me say something. I, Oshomale may have <laughs> committed class suicide later. But as at that time Oshomole was in government, yes. like you rightly said, Oshomole understood that labor must be led by ideology. Yes. And their ideology must be devoid of any compromise of what the ideology demands. What do you uh, then think Oshomole will have done in this kind of situation? In this, in this situation, in the way the government came mm. with that, the policy of uh, removing subsidy, if it's Oshomole, that government will not even succeed with that removal of subsidy. Because it will, it, will, it will totally oppose it. But didn't, and tell government didn't, because, Osh uh, uh, didn't Oshomole support the removal of subsidy? What happened now? Yeah, I mean now. <laughs> because he has, he has gone to the other, <laughs> other side. Yeah, yeah, so he, he will talk from that perspective he now. Has been, he has been assimilated. Exactly. <laughs> now he has, he, has, he has joined governance. How, okay. How, how divergent do you think then that the aspirations of labor and the intentions of government to provide a better uh, space for Nigerians to 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 to, to prosper. Mm -hmm. How divergent do you think the two the two sides are? Is it in terms of policies, in terms of uh, of uh, implementation, or uh, because? I, I I know there must be a, a common ground let, let, where let, what labor wants. Uh, let me just tell you what is the problem now yes. between the government and the labor now. This government's ideology is clearly neoliberal. That's the way we, I see it and that's the way many people see it. This government is operating a neoliberal ideology of IMF, World Bank and that all those things have been done before in Nigeria. What we are facing now, we face similar things when Nigeria took when they took a IMF loan or what? Or, sorry, social adjustment program that was recommended in the 80s. Yes, social adjustment program means removal of subsidy, uh, devaluing your nera. All these things that were what brought a whole lot of problem in the 80s for this country that we managed for about 20, 20 years before we got our, our legs back. This government, as I see it, is operating those same set of policies of removal of subsidy. Because if we listen to people outside this climb, even in America, they will tell you if anybody says that subsidy is not being 
paid in America by American government. Those people are telling you lies. American but government, their own is yeah. more targeted yes, towards see. industries that they know are going to uh, look at the success of uh, the Anchors Borrowers yes, Program, yes. which uh, immensely jump started agriculture. Uh, I understand. Country. But so now it, it has been reversed too, to, to go to back to your extent. to go back to your to the, to what I was saying. The government today is operating a neoliberal ideology, and labor can never agree with that ideological position of government because labor is coming from the perspective of subsidizing welfare. Is see welfare is economy. Government must make sure that the citizens enjoy whatever is to be enjoyed at no cost. But labor has never quite expressed itself. Uh, has been in total opposition to those neoliberal policies. They are simply trying to mitigate the impacts by demanding for more wages, for example, rather than uh, actually creating a structure. And that is where they have gone wrong. That is what is wrong with labor now. So because if labor, if labor is not coming out to oppose the fundamentals of the thinking of government that is bringing all this hardship to the people, then what, what, what are they there for? So yeah? we can safely conclude yeah. that this yeah. This minimum wage demand, even if it is uh, accepted and pushed over, is not going to solve any problem. It is not going to solve any problem because if, unless the other policies that the government has brought into place now, all these other ones we mentioned, if they if they are rebu robustly implemented, eh, the minimum wage will stabilize the the polity and people will be able to bear the effect of all this uh, inflationary trend. Uh, then, uh, how, then do, we, then how do you propose? uh consumer credit to nigerians who are culturally averse to taking debts no we, within government yes within those who take pay from government there yeah. in states local government and the federal government that consumer credit scheme is very is, it, it suits it suits it suits them let me look at it from the civil service, public servant perspective without consumer credit mm. a civil servant will not acquire anything. Most civil servants use that through cooperative. Yes. To get, buy land, gradually build their house in three, four, five years. You want you buy land, you take loan over loan, loan upon loan from the cooperative, then you get you will now pay back with your salary. That consumer credit scheme has been helping a lot of public servants already through the cooperatives in the states, federal government. But the cooperatives government. are largely an in, informal structure. Yeah, but they operate within they operate seamlessly and effectively in most places because those who contribute to cooperatives are like shareholders and they monitor closely they will never allow anybody mess up with their funds so now that has helped a lot of people to look away from government i'm talking from as, as a former public servant if you don't have those schemes in place honestly sometimes you can't play, pay, pay your Pay your, pay your children's but fees. government also has now what, 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 what i'm coming to do where, is that I, where you can pull funds from from yes. civil servants like national housing fund exactly which civil servants by the way cannot even access, no access it. you know it doesn't uh, work yeah. <laughs> but their money is still <laughs> let there me, let me tell you those so those schemes so so when you say if, if all those schemes that you have, we have mentioned now where the credit control that we're talking about is for people who are credit worthy Yes. For example, now, if you have no salary, where do you draw your credit? Where did you, yes. There are people who are not paid salary all over the place in this country. 80% of Nigeria don't live on government salaries. So where do they draw their credits? So if you even do all these things with that attacks, people, uh, the problem of those who work, we should think beyond that. Those who work at the point will, will not work again. So where do you think the solution lies the solution? outside of wage increases? Outside of wage increases, is for the government to be very perspective, pers perceptive in the sense of attacking areas of people's need. And you know, all the critical areas, let us take it, let us start taking it for granted in Nigeria. For example, now let us even use Abuja as an example. All of us are wowed by the infrastructures yes. that have come to this city just in about in two about months a year, now. yes. You, you, we can see how it has helped moving from one place to the other. Those roads are not built for all government alone to move on. That's true. It's for everybody. So such things, if it's replicated all around, everybody will, it will reduce your cost of moving from one point to the other one. Now, if you come to the issue of health too, if you can assess health without any problem, then education, 
those critical food, if those things are taken away as per government should make policies that will really get to the people. This idea of palliative, we should forget about it. It doesn't it doesn't help anybody. Now, the issue now, if government works in that manner by designing programs that will reach everybody, that's why I keep insisting. See, it, it must be programs that will touch every class of Nigerians, whether working or not. We were in this country. The resources of this country belong to all of us, not just to public servants who earn salary. So, if that is the case, we should make sure these resources spread through everybody. That is why the issue of fuel is so important to Nigeria in the sense that this is the only thing only single thing that gets to that everybody everybody and you took it was taken away from then how do we do it now again if we take care of all those all those critical sectors and why policies don't work in this country is this fine policies they are not followed through nobody is monitoring it okay. for example the national housing scheme that i mentioned i was a contributor to that scheme for 30 years 30 years you of working with government. money back when you retire. No, wait. 30, 30 <laughs> good years. Yeah. Where I was contributing my bit and bit because I was hoping that one day I will assess it and build a house. I tried to assess it. I couldn't. Because of all sort of uh, all sort of blockages that will not work. Red, red tape. Then <laughs> the other one they call the federal housing loan that is more aside that that as a civil summer will approach. <laughs> I tried it. They asked for all sort of documents at a point. They just gave it to some few people that the first batch after that batch we tried it didn't come true at a point i look at them i said look if i depend on you people to be the house i will never be the house in my life and i work for government retired as a director and as, a, as, as at that level i cannot assess what government has put in place for me to assess those things don't work and when you have retired from service you wait months to get what you contributed from your post to that fund that you are forced to contribute you don't even get it easily i don't even tell you i was even you don't get it easily some that, people don't even know they are entitled to no everybody is entitled once you are contributing you are supposed mm. to get it but it's not that you retire today and you just get it no you go through some process in nigeria many of the government schemes are very fantastic but what defeats this is that what defeats those schemes are just that they are not followed through People don't monitor people. You know, it's just like you give me a work to do. You give a scheme and it's not working. And nobody is looking at it. It's working. Who is not making what is not making it to work? Who is not making those things to work? Nobody does that. And if you don't have that in place, every policy will fall flat on the ground. Uh, the anchor were aware it was fantastic when it was happening. Why? Why should that thing not continue? Because the beneficiaries didn't pay back their loans. So that is, that is also they just made the money and uh, took off to pilgrimage and stuff. <laughs> not, the, not thinking they have to pay back the loan. So why, well, I'm just generalizing. Why is it that it. Uh, <laughs> people did not think of that before that happened? But, but, but talking, about, talking about ideology, mm. okay. Um, a lot of things you said uh, could work, yeah. but um, you have to have the... Uh, uh, not strictly the, the, the kind of political structure that we operate uh, that uh, is top heavy mm. the federal government dominates everything yeah. uh, in terms of autonomy the ability to actually take initiatives targeting you know particular segments of society mm. you know uh, through the state structure the federating structures mm. is nearly impossible because states cannot generally make the, some decisions by itself okay uh i believe for example that there is a space for national minimum wage mm. and then state can legislate their own minimum wage based on their own realities which i think is what is reasonable in uh, in any economic environment because some states, uh, they even use it as a tool for attracting investment. You are right. Okay, states that pay more get a lot of a lot <laughs> more investment. States that provide more infrastructures get more more investment. Let us Why can't we even let us even look at an issue to address that matter? Even this minimum we will talk about. There are people that told you there are government uh, government uh, what they call it government uh, institutions that don't even operate under this minimum wage. People in the CBN, people in NPC. People in the FRIS, 
do, do they care? Do they all pay with the minimum wage? They don't. <laughs> so, so there are sectors. See, and the way the wage structure is structured in government, the only people who clamor for minimum wage are your civil servant in the federal secretariat. <laughs> that segment. <laughs> eh? Every other sector, the security people, are they dealing with that minimum wage? Their salary is different. You can't see what Nigeria should realize is this. Everybody is not doing the same work. We are not doing the same work. So we cannot earn the same we, money. We cannot earn the same pay. It's not, and, and if we think it like that, it means you cannot expect somebody working in Abuja to earn the same pay with somebody working in Lonnie. Why not? The, no, let me tell, let me tell you. In the indices of life, cost of living in Lonnie, is different from the cost it's of living in Abuja. So why should, why should I earn the same pay with somebody working in Lonnie? Why should somebody working in Lonnie or in Portacot now? Somebody working in Abuja, you aim to work, you get the same money working in Portacot. There was a time I was part of this kind of uh, committee in government to negotiate wage in the sector. And we are make, advancing our reasons. And we made, in the labor, it's a labor union and I had to serve in one of the committees. We are saying, look, we are looking at local. Let government break down this idea of wages. Somebody in Lagos, somebody in Abuja cannot be earning the same pay with somebody in Sokoto or Bauchi. Where the cost, the indices of cost of life is different. Now, if labor is looking at it from that, government and labor are looking at it from that perspective, they must do what? They must truly make this country a federation. Which means that, look, we are the civil service in Nigeria. If you look at the recommendations of past political conference, the other day I just stumbled on the one of the last one, 2014. I look at all the things those, that, that conference recommended. They, they were the things we are now talking about, which the government then refused to take. We, the government that succeeded that, that regime, did not even look at. The thing there is this in this country. Whatever good plan you have before you assume power, you will talk of restructuring. But the moment power is assumed, you will now look at those things are uh, trying to detract from the power that you have just assumed. And if our leaders are not sacrificial to even destruct themselves for the sake of the people, we cannot make progress in this country. What I mean by destructing, the, 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 uh, destroying yourself, destructing, what I mean by that is this. There are, there are steps you take that will, not, that will take out that your absolute power you have as president. Yeah. But the ultimate beneficiary of that sacrifice you make, are the Nigerian people, Nigerian. I never forgot, but Nigerian people, they will, when they are in the opposition, Nigerian politicians, they will talk of restructuring. The moment they get power, if you restructure, restructuring in the means that government, federal government has to devolve a lot of a lot of power. Some funds that federal government is appropriating to itself has to go to states and local government. So when we do all that, of course, the federal government will be less attractive to sit down in Nigeria and say you are controlling the most everything in Abuja. It will not be there again. It will come to a point, even if you are elected to go to the city, you say, no, please leave me here, let me do my business. Let uh, this man who is so passionate about serving, serving people go to the Senate. Well, no, uh, so <laughs> if we don't get to that level, so that eventually, honestly, if anybody is saying that states should pay this amount of money and whatever, where the Senate said, let states dictate the salary they can pay their staff. If you don't want to work, work under the state government, you can go to another state or you go get a federal appointment. So if we, if we check the truly federating countries of the world, America and India, America, mm. it's not like that. Yes. They have different wages, depending on what you are serving. You cannot ask, for example, now, you cannot say just, we already have differential wages in this country because we are not all doing the same thing. So when we are talking about minimum wages, just for a small sector of people in the public service. So if that is the reason, if that is the case, we can, we can we, further civil servant definitely cannot end the same thing with state civil service. So you think the, the, the solution is to not legislate an unrealistic minimum wage that nobody can pay, mm -hmm. but to legislate a realistic minimum wage and let people who can pay above that pay it, pay it yes. so that they can incentivize the workers that are working yes. for them. Okay. If we think of productivity, sir, hmm? think of productivity, performance, and if we put all these things on ground, people will move according to their competencies. Eh? Yes. As we are sitting down here now, I know where if I want to earn astronomically high, eh? I will go and retool myself and go to that, go sector to that sector and earn that salary. If I know I cannot I cannot do those things, 
I remain where my my so, uh, yeah. So how can labor help in bringing that um, dream to reality? Um, outside of agitating for higher pay. No, um, le 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 labor should be concerned about maintaining the basic minimum. We should not fall. Nobody should end a slave wage anywhere. Nobody services should be cash, ca casualized. Labor pickets places, the picket banks, when they see that the, what they call it, the labor policies there are, 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 are human. Eh? That is what labor should be doing. Anywhere they peep into and they see that the basis, the people are degenerating to a level where people are enslaved or play bit paid slave wages. Labor should come in there. Labor should also somebody talk of minimum wage. It should be a baseline. Minimum wage can never be too high. I think you know. Yes. Minimum wage, if it is too astronomically high, is a problem in itself. <laughs> so minimum wage should be the basis of a kind of mer average mer average meal where everybody can key to you can so pay higher. Okay. Than that. That okay. is only if everybody has to comply to the minimum wage mm. law. Mm. Um, at some point, do you not see uh, a problem that those who can pay have two choices? Uh, one is illegal, which is casualization. Yes. The other is not illegal, but it will still lead to problem, and that is downsizing. Ah. So, do you not see a possibility that even if this uh, increases are agreed to, yeah. it will lead to unemployment, which has its own consequences within labor the will never allow, wider economy. Somebody was, labor will never allow downsizing. They will rise in arms against downsizing people from work. Because okay. if, you, if you allow people to be sent out like that, where are they going to? So labor will also not agree to that. So since they know they will not agree to that, that is also at the back of their mind when they are negotiating. All this 490 something is just, uh, they know it. <laughs> they know so they also i know they are also very careful to make sure they arrive at a point where government will not be forced to downsize those things happen in the past in this country where government downsized a lot of public servants many people that were sent away then were later brought back um, many of them came, government brought them back because if you are downsizing you are just creating another problem and let me even tell you even employment in government has become social welfare now in the public sector, I can tell you, 60% of those who work there, they, had, they have nothing to do. Uh, <laughs> let, let, let me be clear. So, so, okay. so, but if government go the way of saying, let us have the right size, now, what happens to those 60%? I've seen government payment of salary as wanting in this country. It's just social service and social welfare. Okay. In some other countries, you pay people <laughs> for being unemployed. But we employ them now and pay them. Honestly, if we have to go on, mm. uh, there's no shortage of um, where we can touch mm. on this issue of uh, minimum wage. And it's wider than most people think because mm. it isn't just about paying a certain sum to alleviate, you know. It's even possible that, you know, price will rise along with higher pay definitely uh, the, the 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 consumer price index will also go up mm -hmm. inflation may may just go through the roof but we are praying that that will not be the case uh but while we are waiting for the template requested by the president to be yeah. submitted yeah. and approved That's whatever the cost is government has already stated its position we are paying more than sixty thousand. how much more nobody knows for now mm -hmm. the negotiation is still on and neighbor said, okay, we'll give you five days to make up your mind. And if nothing is arrived at, we are back to square May 31st, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, uh, Malam uh, Deja Abdullahi, uh, you. for your insightful comments on this issue of uh, uh, minimum wage increase and uh, labor relations in Nigeria. Thank you so much um, for having me. Yeah. Uh, we'll be back with another interesting program uh, of political current um, at some other time. And until then, um, my name is Rashid Oniagi. Thank you for staying with us. <laughs>